Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on forecasting of real estate markets. Our presenter is Julian Rush and I'll be handing over to him in just a few moments, just after I run you through some housekeeping rules, just to make the afternoon go a bit smoother. So this is our agenda, it's very, very simple, just five items. And what I need to tell you is that the slides that you see, as well as the recording of the entire webinar, will be available um, on our SlideShare page, as well as on our YouTube channel. And we will be emailing you with links to these. Um, if you allow about a week to do that, then you'll be able to review what you've heard. Please take time at the end of the session to complete our post-webinar survey. This just helps us keep track on um, making sure that we bring you the best that we can in, in terms of our webinars, and also to get an idea of how you've thought it went. If you have any questions while you're listening to Julian, you'll notice in your control panel that there's a question box. If you type your questions in there, then Julian will allocate about five to 10 minutes after the webinar is over to answer them. So please type your questions. And all that remains for me now is to hand over to Julian. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Much appreciated that you're joining in today. Uh, we could. Uh... So that's uh, that's me. Uh, and now I'd like to talk about uh, forecasting in real estate. Why do we do forecasting? Why is it remotely important? Why can't we ignore what is in fact a rather tricky subject for everybody? Well, the uh, fact is that when we undertake feasibility studies, and by feasibility studies I mean analyses of investments in existing real estate, investments in land, investments in development projects of one variety or another, the decision-making process that we undertake means that the assumptions that we make are absolutely vital for the success of our analysis and eventually our projects. If I were to look back on why the real estate projects I know have gone wrong, it isn't because the construction proceeded wrongly or because contracts were poorly negotiated or because laws were broken. It's almost inevitably because the assumptions that were originally put into the feasibility study turned out to be either massively wrong uh, because of political or risk considerations or somewhat wrong uh, because of economic considerations. So what we're going to be forecasting uh, depends exactly on the assumptions that we put into what are going to be eventually financial models, of which most of us have seen uh, a very large number. And if you've ever carried out any sensitivity analysis on a financial model in real estate, you'll be uh, very well aware that even a relatively small change in some of the key variables results in very substantial swings in net present value, in internal rates of return. And since internal rate of return uh, is what's going to drive shareholder value, then obviously it's important that we do the very best we can to get an accurate forecast. I would go further than that, uh, and, and I don't want to frighten anyone, but there have been a number of court cases of shareholders, disgruntled shareholders, uh, suing firms for not just ultra vires activity, uh, but also making mistakes. And the best defense against any shareholder action uh, is that you did the best possible forecasting that you could. Even if it didn't turn out right, at least you've done the right things in the right way. And uh, nobody can necessarily accuse you of dereliction of duty uh, or failing in your fiduciary responsibilities. And of course, what I'm really arguing here is that uh, discounted cash flow uh, and not very short-term analysis, but rather longer-term analysis, is the absolute core 
valuation of property and, of course, uh, investment decision making. The two are very much part of the same exercise. And we can't make assumptions or shouldn't make assumptions uh, that certain variables are going to remain the same. Um, culpable negligence in producing assumptions in a, in a financial model are things like an assumption that the interest rate for debt will remain exactly the same throughout the entire lifetime of the project. Uh, that's obviously not a very plausible assumption. Or that rents are going to rise by 6% every year from now until whenever, uh, which is not terribly plausible because that's not how the world works. Uh, or any other of these assumptions. And there's a huge number of assumptions uh, about variables uh, which are going to change at the very least annually uh, and most probably are actually going to change more frequently than that. And since markets are generally quite efficient, they will take into account these sorts of changes and so, so should we when we make a decision about what it is that we're going to do. So I don't think there's much argument that we really need to do that forecasting on behalf of our shareholders uh, to ensure that we get the best possible results and we make the right choices between alternative investment and development possibilities. That's the, uh, that's the case for the, uh, uh, for the argument. So the next question is what it is that we're going to forecast and that of course brings us to what the central items are in a development or an investment analysis. Now, the starting point for almost any development project, an investment project, uh, which everyone recognizes, is land. And increasingly, land uh, forms, as I said in the previous webinar, uh, a very large and growing proportion of the value of any real estate development. And in many cases, developers are relying on increases in land value to support the net present value of the projects that they undertake. This is not an unreasonable hypothesis, it's not an unjustified thing to do, but it does mean that any investor or any developer needs to be very clear about what the rising price of land is going to be, what it's going to mean for them, and how it compares to their cost of capital so they can see the extent to which it's justified, for example, to run and operate a substantial land bank. I think I didn't include on this slide, but pretty clearly, if you're engaged in building residential property, then you're going to be interested in price per meter squared. That's the standard method for the valuation of residential property. So you're going to have to be interested in and be able to forecast how much property is going to sell for a meter squared, which usually includes the land cost, whether leasehold or freehold or otherwise. If you're looking at income generating property, offices, retail, malls, warehouses and so on, then the standard method for generating value and the thing that any investor or developer is going to be interested in is of course net operating income. And that means that you have to forecast a whole number of different variables to generate net operating income. So you have to forecast potential gross income, uh, i.e. the future rents on the property, what the rent on that sort of property is going to get. Uh, and also, of course, understand how big the property is going to be. Then you need to be able to forecast vacancy and collections. And finally, operating expenses. And there's plenty of support for this. You get historical data on the way that rents have evolved. You can see uh, evidence on how operating costs have gone. You know what vacancy rates are in the market. There's a lot of market information you can get to have a look at at least how things have gone historically. But your aim then is to get to the rents and the yields over the entire economic life of the property. Now, you can argue that... Uh, it doesn't really matter what happens down after 40 years or so because discounted cash flow will reduce this substantially. I agree with that. I prefer to see people go and do a forecast over the entire economic life of a property uh, rather than assuming a sale. If you are going to assume a sale, uh, then you're going to be involved in almost certainly forecasting the cap rate, uh, which is a very tricky thing to forecast. 
uh, and often I have seen, and I deeply regret this, uh, retro engineering of cap rates to fit designated internal rate of return targets, uh, which is, uh, to say the very least, poor practice. And I think I would go further as saying a breach of fiduciary duty. Uh, nobody should retro engineer cap rates or for that matter NOI levels or anything else. Uh, the, the whole exercise to try and work out uh, best possible estimates about the future um, and then establish whether the project is going to meet your internal rate of return criteria. Lots of other stuff that you had to think about forecasting in the context of, uh, of real estate. So for example comparable assets, bond yields and so forth and the usual the exchange rates if you're investing overseas interest rates when there's debt involved in the exercise, bond rates for, for others, uh, all of those elements. And of course, for developers, then you have to worry about where your cost of construction is going. Uh, so uh, commodity prices will feed through into construction price forecasts of whatever construction uh, that you're going to be undertaking. So there's a large number of different variables in almost every financial model that you're going to be looking at that are actually going to need forecasting in order to do a good job. The challenge is how to do it properly. And the depressing thing for me is the extent to which, whilst there is widespread recognition in this region and not just in this region, that all these things do need forecasting and should be done properly and all the rest of it, that's where the debate ends. Nobody's terribly interested in actually acquiring the necessary technical skills to do the job. And Nobody is prepared to uh, step up and recognize that an effective auditing process on how effective forecasting is within the organization is an integral part of any decent due diligence by a fund or a private equity organization into how uh, the, uh, the developer or the investor has performed. Okay, so given that there are a whole lot of variables that ought to be forecast, how should we go about doing the forecasting exercise? Well, in my view, there are really only three ways that you can forecast anything. Whether it's the price of art, the price of secondhand cars, whether it's going to rain on Tuesday, how much the value of property is going to be, any of these things, you really got a very limited number of choices about how you go and do things. First one, qualitative. There are people who know things about individual markets and individual assets. They're called experts. They're experts because they have a greater quantity of information and knowledge. They, should, they can synthesize a large quantity of information and come out with a better understanding of individual markets and individual assets than other people can. So that's the first one. We ask the experts, and there are places where you can go and ask those experts. Cityscape is a good example. Uh, MIPIM in Cannes is another good example when it comes to property. But certainly identifying and knowing those experts and having a track record of individual experts' performance is something I think is important, and all developers and investors really ought to do that. Quantitative, that's the second one. So we're looking at time series. Uh, classic time series, of course, one, two, three, four, five, six. What's the next number likely to be? Well, seven. And, and quantitative analysis can be taken to be uh, equivalent in forecasting to technical analysis in stocks, uh, where you predict the value of a future stock on the basis of the evolution of the stock price itself, and quite specifically don't take into account external environments and external changes and fundamentals. Fundamental analysis, on the other hand, uh, which is practiced by economists, suggests that the value of a share, uh, and for that matter, for example, the price of wheat or anything else of that nature, is caused by a number of different factors. And in real estate, it's exactly the same. Uh, if we're building a causal model for real estate, we're presuming that the value, each of the individual values that we're attempting to forecast, is a function of other uh, time series which are going to contribute to those things. And then finally, uh, in terms of methodologies, what we have to do is to go and see, having made all our forecasts individually, we go back and see which forecasts actually work, which will track the data. And what you can do here is to reduce the existing data series that you've got uh, and go back and see how effectively uh, your forecasts work in predicting the present and the recent past. 
And you can also go back over your forecast and see uh, last year how good you were, the year before how good you were, uh, which of the methodologies is actually working and which ones are failing to work. And so it's very important if you're going to do forecasting in any in any way uh, that you do actually keep a track record. Uh, you understand how good you are at the business, which ones work, which ones don't, where you've gone wrong and so forth. Because there's a great danger of what a friend of mine at the USDA called model side, that you build an expertise up within an organization over a period of time um, and then it ends up being lost when people move from the organization. So that's where we are with forecasting methodologies. There's a great deal of information out there on all of these things. So if you go and go to Google and type in qualitative forecasting, you'll get a mountain of stuff. You look at, at quantitative forecasting on time series, universities and so forth, you get an enormous quantity of information. The problem with, with the information that's available, and most of it's available for free, uh, it's not that uh, there's not enough information, it's just an overwhelming quantity of it, much of it incredibly repetitive. Um, what I'm inclined to think is that particularly for the quantitative and the causal methodologies, the right approach to this is to get locked into a piece of software, and I'll come to the software question later on, and follow that rather than trying to build expertise generally, uh, because understanding how to build equations and how to, to look at time series in the abstract is one thing. Uh, as busy business people, I think we really ought to look at it in terms of what we do in practice, and that really means understanding how to do it, and that in turn means understanding of the relevant software. So let's go through each of the uh, individual methodologies now, looking at uh, qualitative methods, first of all, uh, starting off by uh, asking the experts, I said we, we ask them at, uh, at seminars and so forth, I make uh, one uh, mention of uh, one particular methodology in respect of positive uh, analysis, which I think is quite interesting, um, and that's the, uh, the Delphi technique, which involves putting a group of experts together and asking them an opinion and then taking the results of their analysis and distributing those results anonymously to the individual experts and then asking them to reforecast based on their experience of other people's estimates. And I had the opportunity actually of doing this in practice in Q8 in September 2013 with a group of experts there, developers, who were particularly interested in the uh, Kuwait market. And so we did just that. We asked them to forecast forward five years. <clears throat> and then we, we got some optimists, we got some pessimists. And then we asked them to reforecast. And what we saw was the classic Delphi phenomenon of the outliers beginning to move together. And we started to move towards a consensus view of the group as a whole about where the Kuwait market was going. And of course, this relies on having a group of people who were experts, who were interested in the same thing, who were there in the same place at the same time. And, and a couple of iterations, probably enough to, uh, to go, and, go and do that. Usually, it's useful to eliminate the outliers in such exercises. And we can also have uh, other qualitative methods, um, mind mapping and so forth, which uh, assist you in getting the sort of results that you need out of this. I would always recommend <clears> that developers do carry out qualitative forecasting. I think it's a good idea. It's often the best methodology. I've been struck by the fact that numerous developers and investors all recognize that they should do it, but there's been a lamentable lack of systematization of qualitative forecasting within these organizations. And whenever I've asked anyone, uh, for evidence that they actually carry out proper qualitative forecasting within their organization, I get weak smiles, which is, which is really not good enough. Uh, some effort needs to be made to, to make this work. People who are experts, because they know more, and, and their, their views should be taken into serious consideration, and you want to get them so that they have no vested interest in promoting the view one way or the other. Really very, very important. So, the results from each of the individual experts that you get, you audit them, you record them, and you find out who's good at, at the forecast, who's bad at the forecasts, and build up a database of people who are going to be asked these questions going forward. So that's the first one. That's qualitative methods. That deals with that issue. 
All right, so that's not enough. I don't think anyone believes that quality of forecasting really should be the only basis on which anyone uh, should carry out a forecast. The next method is time series. And the essence of this is to fit a curve based on historical practice to a particular data set with the aim of fitting the curve as closely as possible to the information that's provided. Now, if you think about two curves, a curve of actual data and a curve of hypothesized data based on the uh, model, based on the extrapolations, there's going to be some errors. Think about the errors as distance between the two different series. Now, so let's call each of those distances x1, x2, and x3. Now, again, if you think about it, there are lots of different ways that you can use those x's in terms of analyzing the closeness of fit. The best way, or at least the most common way, is mean squared error. So if I take x1, I square it, and then I take x2, and I square it, and 3, and so forth. This has several effects. One effect is that it eliminates negative numbers. So uh, whatever the time series, the two relations to one another are above or below, they cancel out. Second thing it does, of course, is that uh, if you take an x1 of, let's say, 2, uh, 2 times 2, that's 4. x2, let's say, is 3. 3 times 3 is 9. So the effect of this is that large errors are increased relative to small errors, which I think most people regard as a good idea, because we're quite content for our forecasting to have small errors, but what we don't want is to have large errors. So that's the mean forecast exercise. Now there are various ways of extrapolating. The simple method of I've talked about the naive one, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's one. Another way of constructing a forecast time series is to take what's called a moving average, and that's quite straightforward. It means that you take an average of the past four years or five years, or it happens to be, and then move it along and continue to move it along the process. And the idea here, of course, is that you are taking into account uh, more recent years and you're discarding old data and introducing new data as you go forward. So that's an improvement of a naive extrapolation. You can go further, you can have a weighted moving average model. You can say, all right, uh, we think that what's happened over the past three years is more important than what happened over the three years before that. So we'll weight the current three years more highly than we will the years before. And as you can imagine, you can construct a whole series of different ways of, of using historical data to match the actual historical data, to generate a, a curve that fits the data most accurately. Uh, and the task of an effective time series modeler is to construct something that really works in terms of, of, of fitting and reducing the mean squared error. An exponential smoothing, which is another version of the whole thing, introducing ver additional variables into the exercise, constants and so forth, uh, which move the, the entire series up, down, left, right, and change it, uh, log it, do other modifications to it, all in the interest of trying to make the closest fit uh, to the curve. And what you end up with is something that looks something like this. This is just an example. We're trying to predict why, uh, and we can possibly look at a uh, the value of the time series, a given particular time series in type T, uh, and we want to look at the trend. So the trend with property is often inflation, uh, a good example. And then there might be a seasonal element to this. If we're selling ice cream, it's probably more important than selling property, but even with property, we may have some seasonal variations, particularly in this part of the world. And then there's a cyclical component, and goodness me, is there ever a cyclical component of property. Uh, we, we know that the property variables run on a number of different cycles. They run on the long-term contratif cycle. They run on the medium-term uh, macroeconomic cycle. They run on small uh, real estate cycles. And a good time series model will build all of those different cycles into the model and be able to identify them. And then finally, 
uh, there's unfortunately always, uh, because we're not perfect, there's always going to be one irregular component of the series which we just can't fix, and that's the failure of our, of our model. And the larger that component is, uh, the more in ineffective our model actually is. And the various measures that time series analysis will give you on how effective your fit is. The longer the data you have, the more accurate the data you have, the better the time series forecast you're going to get. And as we move forward in this region with more and more data, uh, I think we're in a position to have better and better time series analysis. So is this enough? Policy of analysis, time series analysis, is it enough? No, it isn't. And my due diligence on any real estate developer, any real estate investor, one of the first questions I'm going to ask anybody is, show me your regression model. Show me the causal forecasting model that you use to analyze the future. And if you can't show me that either you or your consultants have actually produced a proper causal forecasting model uh, for your investment, I'm not putting my money anywhere near your organization because you almost certainly will eventually run out of road and get the forecast horribly wrong, even if you are using time series forecasting. So a causal forecasting model, of which the most well-known one is regression analysis, and that there are other ones, um, but the most, the most well-known example is regression. You're looking at the idea that the values that you're interested in, interest rates, exchange rates, future value of property, and so forth, are all a function of various independent variables. And if you sit down now and start to think, think about the level of, of uh, let's say, we're interested in the uh, level of prices for uh, residential real estate in, in Dubai, let's say, and we can think there are a number of factors that will influence that. And some of them will be uh, politically independent variables. Uh, some of them will be economic variables like employment, or GDP growth. Uh, some of them will be social variables. Some of it will have to do with the supply of residential property that comes on the marketplace. If you dump a large quantity of supply onto the marketplace in the future, you're going to drive down prices. If you increase immigration into a given location, you're going to increase prices. There are all sorts of independent variables that we can introduce. Indeed, uh, when you look at the valuation of residential property, uh, there are some house price indices of which the well, most well-known one is the HBOS index in the UK that uses the principle of independent variables to measure uh, the price change in property by uh, standardizing for all the different independent variables of property like size and number of garages and size of garden and all the rest of it, leaving one variable left, which is the effect of price change. And that's where you get a really good, what's called a really good hedonic uh, price uh, indicator, which is a really effective way of measuring price change, because if you don't use a hedonic variable indicator for price change, uh, then you may be capturing changes in the quality of the stock rather than changes in the actual price level. So for us, in forecasting real estate, not just valuing it, uh, then we want to look at regression analysis. Now, I, I normally suggest that straightforward linear regression analysis where you set down a series of independent variables and you just integrate those variables as independent with one dependent variable and work out what the uh, what the result is that's probably enough uh, and i and i would say that you want to go as far as a multiple regression model but that's probably far enough to go uh, in terms of, of what you do there are extensions of the regression modeling technique uh, which is to use what's called a structural equation model, where you take variables A and B and you use that to predict C and then you use C and D to predict E and so forth. But I think that's probably going a bit far. What you need to do is to look at a multiple linear regression model, and that's probably far enough for anybody in the market. How are you going to do it? Well, the first thing I would say, uh, anybody here, is just please don't try and do this using Excel. Excel has wonderful qualities, and it's very good for financial modeling and so on, but it's really hopeless at, at forecasting. It doesn't have sophisticated modeling uh, forecasting skills built into it. It is not user-friendly for forecasting purposes, and it doesn't have the automated process that you really ought to rely on. Firms like Sony and Toshiba and a lot of others, now they use batch forecasting software, which is very inexpensive, like Forecast Pro or Smart Forecast. And I'm inclined to think that's probably enough for most real estate developers. Look, 
even using forecast pro or smart forecast and putting independent variables in and generating a decent regression model is a huge improvement over sticking 6% down and just having that as the growth of rents over the next 15 years. It's a, it's a vast advance and probably quite sufficient of an advance. The other thing about Forecast Pro and Smart Forecast, a couple of things about them. First of all, they have automated systems in there, so you don't need to really learn a great deal about how to be a forecaster. You simply need to know how to put the data in, and then Forecast Pro and Smart Forecast will do the job for you. And they've been doing this job since 1992, 1993, uh, and they're now very, very nice, slick pieces of software which add on into Excel uh, and, and also enable you to tap into the community of people internationally who use Forecast Pro and Smart Forecast, and they're very good. So I, I would recommend those. If you want to go further, if you want to become an expert on building structural models uh, and manipulating data and going beyond the multiple linear regression, uh, which is relatively straightforward to do, uh, then you really need to move across to the more complicated econometric software. Uh, now, this stuff is not terribly user-friendly. I use Starter now. I used to use SPSS, uh, and I use it for various econometric purposes. But even I recognize that this is not a terribly easy uh, exercise to, to do. I do think that it's desirable that somebody, if they're going to produce complex forecasts, uh, forecasts ought to know these things. If you can do it in-house, I think Forecast Pro or Smart Forecast is enough. Uh, but if you're going to, to go and go to a consultant, then I think one of the questions ought to be on, uh, uh, on this, uh, that they, which sof software they use and how effective they're going to, going to be. And I, I would go further and say, well, you really need to get your consultants to show you the independent variables that they've used, the methodologies they've used to predict those independent variables, You've got to understand the error messages that come out from, from, uh, from, from regression models, you understand the meaning of things like R squared and so forth uh, in, in this to the, the goodness of fit of any regression model and what the error statistics in regression models are going to, going to do. And one of the ways of doing this, of course, is to go back to the, the individual consultants and say, right, okay, uh, this is what you've, you've uh, forecast for us. Now show me what happens when you slice off the last year of data. How effective are you at forecasting the, the actual data as opposed to just the future? Uh, what are the, the, the sorts of questions you have to ask them? What are the most dominant uh, independent variables that you've found? What happens when you add additional uh, independent variables in, what degree of autocorrelation have you observed? In other words, what degree of variables uh, actually latch on to other variables and may be, in fact, identical in their predicting capacity? So, you, so how, how much theoretical parsimony is there uh, in, in the model that you're generating? Uh, what is the relationship between the forecast of the individual variables? So if you're forecasting yields and rents and so forth, what are the different variables that, that work in this? And, and one of the things that I like doing is getting consultants to forecast uh, two of the three, so say rents and capital values, and then seeing what the effect is on yields. And if the yields go crazy, then obviously you, you, it's implausible. Then there's something wrong with the uh, with the forecasting exercise you're going to do. And you've got to run it forward over quite a long time. We end to this business of five years forecast and using simple numbers, and then assume a sale and stop that and go for full economic life modelling uh, going forward. Now, a lot of the consultants in this region have got these capabilities. They can do it. Jones Lang, LaSalle, CBRE, I mean, I don't have invidious in, in limiting myself, but all the management consultants as well, the PWCs and the KPMGs and all the rest of it, they've all got this capacity. But if you don't ask them and don't press them to go and use this stuff, then they're not going to use it, and they're going to come back to you and just give you the 6% and the individual, individual items. Now, I'm pretty convinced that this is the right way to go. It's essential for an effective uh, financial model. It's the core of any decent feasibility study to get it right. <clears throat> and if there's any more evidence that you want in terms of, of the need for forecasting, you really have only to look at what happened in Dubai uh, after around the time 2007, 2008, where I got endlessly asked, when is the boom going to end? When is it going to end? Or will it end by the less uh, or the more credulous uh, 
and nobody was able to come back and say, well, actually, it's going to end at this point, in our opinion, because we've done proper forecasting and proper analysis. So I wish you luck. Uh, if anybody wants to contact me about any aspect of forecasting, feel free. Uh, as you can see, I'm very keen that this should become an integral part of what we do with real estate, and I'm pretty convinced it will help protect the value of our investments and the limited partners' investments in the real estate uh, operations that we undertake going forward. We need to do a better job than we did uh, in the 2000s, and forecasting is going to assist us in getting that better job to be done. Okay. Sorry, have you caught the change in the slides? Um, there should be slide changes throughout the whole uh, presentation. I certainly saw the slides change on my presentation. I hope you did as, as well. So, does anybody have any, any questions? If anybody does, I'd be very, very happy to... Uh, oh, yeah, okay, question on this one. Look, I've, I've used most of these, eViews I, and, and uh, MicroTSP all have their supporters. I've now uh, used Starter and SPSS. And I have to say, although please don't tell anybody that I said so, ho, ho, uh, I prefer SPSS. I really do. I think it, it is, none of these is very user-friendly, but my vote would go for SPSS. I've seen people who strongly support micro TSP. I certainly wouldn't go for starter. If you've got some complicated um, analysis to do in terms of data comparison, uh, then starter is great. And I can understand why people need it for those purposes. But the functionality that one requires out of this uh, this software software uh, is is only a very small proportion of what it's actually capable of generating, and therefore simplicity is is really what's required. I'm inclined to think that for most practical purposes, the the business forecasting software will do nicely, quite frankly. But uh, but thanks very much for the question. Oh, SPSS, what does SPSS refer to? Uh, it's just the name of the software. It's, uh, it's, it's been um, universally recognized. You know, search what it stands for. Uh, simulation software, I think, is the second, second part of it. It's just the name of the, uh, of the software. Um, question about to build a regression model in a real estate development company, who should I hire? You've got a choice. It's a very good question. I touched on this towards the end, but you've got a choice. Uh, you can go to the chartered surveyors and say, look, now don't muck me around. Bring somebody in who actually understands regression modeling, and I'll talk to you. Bring somebody in. I want to see them work. I want to see the model. I want to see the, the inputs. I want to see the outputs. I want to see all the correlations. I want to see the R squares. I don't want to just see the results on a PDF. I want to see the result. I want to see it and have someone talk me through it on the, with the relevant software. Now, they will do that. They can actually get people to do that. But if they're not asked to do it, they won't do it. Exactly the same with, with PwC and all the others. They've got those things. Alternatively, go online, have a look, find a specialist consultant. Um, there are specialist consultants who will do these things. Final possibility, and it's a very real possibility, you, you can do this, go to a university. There are stacks of people in universities who understand how to use this sort of software. You just need to find the right person, and they will build you a regression model to, to go into it. And they're probably quite inexpensive. I mean, I'm not standing up for universities per se, but quite honestly, there's a lot of expertise around there. Really, there is. Um, right, okay, yeah, I know, Redin, no, none of these people tell you 
there's a question about Reading.com and, 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 and how they do their forecasts. No, none of these people, whether they're Reading or, or anybody else, will actually tell you um, how they've done their forecasts. It is certainly possible to forecast in that way by using one of these programs. That's absolutely right. But which program they use and what their independent variables are and what the data they're using is and all of that, you'd have to be inside the organization to know. There's a lot of intellectual property in that exercise. I would suggest that anybody certainly should take the forecasts from organizations like Redin. Um, but I wouldn't be satisfied with just using those. I think you should treat them as an expert like any other expert and then go and build your own model. Yeah, examples of, of dependent and independent variables. Look, the, the dependent variable is whatever it is you need to forecast for your model. So I did give a stack of examples, the sorts of things, right at the beginning of the, uh, of, of, of the presentation on what dependent variables there are. So things like rents and yields and interest rate costs and capital values and land prices and all that stuff, that's what we're trying to predict. So there's the dependent variables. The independent variables are whatever predicts them. So have a think about what you think might predict land prices. What drives land prices? I'm engaged in research at the moment to indicate a degree of, of complementarity between developer strategies and land prices. And there are a lot of things that generate land prices. Uh, we know what they are. The release of land by the government, for example. Uh, the, the density of, of, of real estate development by developers. Uh, GDP growth, population growth and density, immigration, foreign direct investment, a whole lot of other things. And comparable assets and a number of other things. So those are the independent variables. So the principle is dependent variables are what you want to forecast, independent variables are the time series that you use in order to be able to make those forecasts. That's the idea of it. Oh, well, thanks uh, very much for your questions. Uh, very, very good questions indeed. Uh, much appreciated. I wish you all luck. Um, please don't hesitate to get back to me via uh, Informa uh, if you have any further questions about this or any evidence or any, anything like this. We should certainly keep this discussion going because this is something that really isn't going to go away and all of us really uh, need to care about. I certainly try to raise these issues um, on all the courses that I take here at Informa uh, and I hope that all of you will have the opportunity of, of putting this into practice within your own organizations uh, going forward. Uh, what's the next topic? I presume you mean the next topic for a for a webinar in in this regard. Um, and and the answer to that one is that we'll we're deciding on that now. And we'll uh, we'll let you know uh, in the next week or so. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Thanks for joining in, and, and I'll look forward to being with you later on next time.